All eyes in the sports world are on New York, the WNBA draft, and it's our pleasure to welcome in Sabrina Merchant to talk about it, the athletic staff writer covering women's basketball, college, WNBA. She does it all. Sabrina, thanks so much for your time, and welcome to the show. Appreciate it on a, uh, a busy one. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. So um, I want to talk about the Mystics, obviously, locally uh, here in a second. They're going to have some potentially really interesting options at six. But we, we can start with the headliner, that, that Caitlin Clark. Uh, you know, she's, she's got a couple of eyes on her. And you wrote a piece for The Athletic where you talked to a couple of people about what the transition will be like for her. Ultimately, as you come away from reporting that and, and add your own, uh, you know, your own observations and your own experience to it, what do you think Clark's rookie season will look like with the Indiana Fever? You know, it's interesting. I hadn't realized what, not to say a low bar, but just statistically what rookies have been able to accomplish in the WNBA until I started reporting that. Only three rookies have ever even averaged 20 points per game. And within the last 20 years, only two rookies have averaged five assists per game. And Clark obviously just shattered those numbers when she was at Iowa. So it's interesting to think that even if she takes a dip from what she was able to do in college, she could still be one of the most productive rookies of all time. And I think that's really what I came away with is that she has so many different skill sets that she'll be able to contribute when she gets to Indiana that even if defenses are able to take away some of the scoring or, you know, she's not able to get into the paint and drive and kick and things of that nature, there's so many other things she can do on a basketball court that something is going to translate. And I think you know, she's in contention to be on that Olympic team. She'll be in the conversation for an old WNBA team at the end of the year. I do think it's going to be a productive season for her, even if it's not, you know, 32 points and eight rebounds and eight assists per game like we saw in her senior year at Iowa. Um, how does she pair from a basketball standpoint with Aaliyah Boston? Um, well, obviously, uh, I, I can't imagine what that was like for Aaliyah to watch, uh, you know, the, all the coverage as she's sitting there at the right. desk and <laughs> just a rising star uh, that's going to take uh, all of our jobs on the media side whenever she wants to. Uh, but she's also, by the way, awesome at basketball. Obviously, last year's number one overall pick for those that, that don't know. Um, so, but how do they fit from like a, a basketball pairing schematic standpoint? Yeah, what an interesting experience for Leah Boston to be watching that South Carolina-Iowa game. All of her former right. teammates up against her future teammates. <laughs> uh, just a win-win all around. Yes. But I think, you know, you look at Clark's first three years at Iowa and how well she paired with Monica Sinano, a really strong pick-and-roll post-up center. And Leah Boston is just factually better at everything than Monica Sinano was. She's extremely athletic. She's a great screener, a great roller. Uh, scores really well inside. So I think that two player combo is going to be the foundation of everything Indiana runs. And just defensively, I don't think Clark's ever had a big behind her who could do the things that Aaliyah Boston does in terms of protecting the rim. So it really gives her some cover in terms of defending on the perimeter. One thing about the W is like you have to defend at a high level uh, in, in that league, like, <laughs> even compared to the like the intensity of defense compared to the NBA. It, you know, it's much more play what I would consider like NBA playoff intensity. Um, the the intensity of Caitlin's defense at Iowa uh, didn't have to be the highest on most nights. Uh, that was not her responsibility. She could let Gabby Marshall and mm -hmm. others go dog the the opponent's best guards. How concerned were the folks that you talked to in your reporting about how her transition, about her ability to turn it up on the defensive end to play WNBA caliber defense? Yeah, I think that's a really great point. First of all, just because there isn't anybody for her to hide on, right? There's such a high level of talent in the WNBA that every team you're going to play has two or three perimeter threats. So it's not like you can just say, hey, Kelsey Mitchell, you take the good one and I'll take the bad one. There aren't any bad ones in the WNBA. So like you said, you have to be on right away. And I think the thing that I came across when I was talking to people around the league was just there's going to be some extra effort when it comes to players going up against Caitlin. Like they're going to want to involve her a little bit more often. They're going to want to get by her. They're going to want to make her look a little silly on defense. It's just a natural instinct when someone comes in with that much hype. So I do think that uh, she's going to be tested quite a bit individually, defensively. And that's okay because she has a lot of the physical tools you'd want for a good defender. She's really big. Obviously, she's in excellent condition. And it's not like she needs to save all of her energy and all of her fouls for the offensive end because she doesn't carry as much of a load on that end as she did when she was in college. So I do think that side of the floor is going to be a bigger transition for her just because it wasn't something that she excelled at in college. 
But I think in that system in Indiana where she has strong defensive players around her, where she is less relied on on the offensive end, she'll be able to give more of her energy there. And like, I don't think we're ever going to talk about Caitlin Clark as an all-defense type player, but I think right. she'll get to the point where she's perfectly passable on that end and it's not hurting her or her team. Right. And that is one thing about Caitlin that I'm not sure even like players in the league and watching some of the commentary on Twitter, which is obviously where you should go for the best, uh, you know, material always. Um, <laughs> but, you know, l- watching, watching them watch her, I don't know that players in the W realize just how big and fast she is, that she is a legit six feet. Like she has uh, from like a scouting, you know, if, if you're, if you're talking to a scout, they'd be like, yeah, no, she's got a thick lower half. Like she's, she's got a base underneath her um, from an athletic sense. Mm-hmm. Like I, I do wonder if, if maybe she'll be better on that front. And as someone who has gotten the chance to watch her up close, like, did it surprise you, for instance, the first time you saw her, especially as a senior, because she has like worked really hard in the weight room throughout her career at Iowa, when you saw her in person versus watching her on TV, the, the difference in, in what you saw? Yeah, I think her body like looks like somebody who can play at the WNBA level. I wouldn't say she's scrawny or anything. Um, you know, She definitely has the physical build. Like you said, she's worked really hard on building up her strength, and she is tall and long and all of those things are going to serve her very well in the WNBA. I think most of it is what you alluded to earlier. It's just the effort. Like she's never been required to try that hard on the defensive end. It's like you can go for steal sometimes, but otherwise let's save the energy. Let's make sure you don't collect too many fouls because we have to keep you in the game for 40 minutes. Um, And I think just uh, a change in perspective, like that shift is going to help her a little bit where, you know, we can't just make you be an offense only player. That's just not going to work at this level. Sabrina Merchant, staff writer at The Athletic, is with us here on The Hoffman Show. So the Mystics sit at six in this draft. I've seen, uh, you know, J.C. Sheldon from Ohio State mock to them. I've seen Aaliyah Edwards from UConn uh, mock to them. I'd love to get, like, a, a, a scouting report on those two. Let's start with Sheldon, the guard from Ohio State, probably the lesser known because people did watch Connecticut uh, in mass. Uh, we know on that Friday night versus Iowa, but certainly um, that program mm-hmm. is so well known. What's kind of the scouting report on J.C. Sheldon uh, and why is she considered a, a top seven pick in this draft? I think she's just very translatable as a three and D guard. She shot really well from three point range over her last two seasons at Ohio state, took a high volume of them too. And a really good team defender, obviously Ohio state runs this press that makes it very easy for JC Sheldon to collect a lot of steals. So her staff look a little inflated from that respect, but even one-on-one she's just good at staying in front of her, guard and making sure that, you know, the opponent doesn't really get into the paint. Uh, and again, like we were talking about Caitlin, just like excellent conditioning. She plays a lot of minutes. She never seems to tire out. So you can just immediately see her slotting into a role player type function where, you know, she can hit shots, she can defend her position and she can, you know, kind of run as, as a secondary ball handler, if that's what you need. And then for Leah Edwards, the, the forward from UConn, uh, what's the scouting report on her, and how would she potentially fit next to Shakira Austin in D.C.? Yeah, I think Aaliyah Edwards benefits because of the track record of UConn bigs coming into the league. Like, even the lesser heralded ones, like Olivia Nelson Adota or Dorka Juhas, who came into the league last year, like, all of them have had a really high floor coming out of UConn, and Aaliyah Edwards probably has the highest floor out of any of them. She's just an excellent rebounder, excellent pick-and-roll player, defends really well inside. Uh, she needs to expand her shooting range a little bit. And that was tough at Connecticut because she was playing center for so long and was playing right up against the basket. But, you know, with her and potentially Shakira Austin playing together, that's something that you'd like to see her work on is just like that 15 foot jumper. And, you know, you'd expect her to be able to develop that because she was a pretty decent free throw shooter at UConn. I think during her senior season, she made like 75% of her free throws, same as her senior year. So, uh, you'd expect her to continue to develop those skills. And I mean, just like I said, all of those Huskies, they just come in with an incredible understanding of how the WNBA game works. They're so well prepared by Gina Oriema. So I think, you know, just coming out of that program, you have a lot of faith in what Aaliyah Edwards could be. Um, Shakira actually put out a tweet 
the other day asking Mystics fans who they want to see. And uh, in a shocking turn of events, uh, the the number one response was Angel Reese from LSU. Uh, she is local-ish uh, from Baltimore. Baltimore town, and, yeah. yeah. I'm not, I'm not going to try to start any DC Baltimore wars here on the radio show. I'm going to say local-ish. <laughs> Everybody's happy with that description. Uh, local-ish here to, to the, the, the metro Atlantic area or the mid-Atlantic area. Um, but obviously... We, we saw what she can do uh, in that, that last game against Iowa, 20 rebounds. Um, she's been a tremendous player, a national champion. But I know there are real concerns with her offensive game not translating to the, the WNBA because her range is extremely limited. Where do scouts come in on her? And do you think there's any chance that Washington takes her? Yeah, I think you kind of hit on the – difficulty of projecting her offense because like Aaliyah Edwards, Angel Reese did play out of position her senior year at LSU as well. You know, she's playing center, even though I think she's definitely going to have to be a power forward in the WNBA, but that means that, you know, all of her best gifts at being just this outstanding rebounder and finishing right at the rim, like that's a lot harder to do when you're a power forward and your center is also in the lane clogging up that space. So I think that's part of the difficulty with Angel is we don't know what like because she was obviously so productive at the college level it's hard to know how many of those things she'll be able to do with the WNBA when she's playing at a different position um and even though she's an incredible athlete at the college level like everybody WNBA is better athletes so is her rebounding prowess gonna show up the same way um I don't think she's the kind of player who would fit in Washington just because of the fact that Shakira Austin is already here as one of Washington's building blocks, I think you'd need someone with a little bit more ability to play out on the perimeter, which is not Angel Reese's best skill. I think she fits better with a floor spacing center, and that's just not what Shakira Austin is. Even though she can, Shakira kind of can kind of operate at a high post. I don't think I love that combination of the two of them. Uh, I would be surprised if Washington ended up taking Angel, even though she is extremely talented. I think they would probably want someone who fits more naturally alongside Austin and Ariel Atkins. Yeah, no, that would make a lot of sense. Uh, Stephanie Dolson, obviously another UConn big they bring in in the off season who can shoot it from three and, and is a true center to let Shakira play that power forward spot. Um, seems to be more of the model. Um, two more questions for you real quick, Sabrina, as we're just now 30 minutes away from the WNBA draft. First, uh, just to wrap up the draft side of this for the Mystics, any, any other names that you would keep an eye on for Washington when they get on the clock at six? I mean, I think it's going to be, as much as I know Mystics fans won't want to hear this, like a little bit of a runway for them to get back to contention. So maybe looking at some international prospects who might not be able to contribute in year one, but could look good going forward. I know one of the invitees to the green room was an Australian forward named Nadia Plotch, who's only 19 years old. So you obviously don't expect her to be great right away, but I think the Mystics have a little bit of time. Um, so yeah, just keeping an eye on the international prospects, even though it won't be super fun to watch them in the year 2024. Uh, but I think, you know, Mike Tebow's always done a really great job of drafting later too. So even keeping an eye on who they take in the second round could be interesting just as a, a flyer for this particular mystic squad. And then the last question is kind of just a big picture where the mystics are. As you mentioned, this could be a long runway back to contention. Um, Elena Deladon kind of steps away. Um, I don't even know how that's officially being mm -hmm. termed. She's, she's not playing this year um, for, for Washington or Correct. currently for anybody else. Natasha cloud leaves in free agency and you just kind of have what feels like an exodus and a start over uh, the year after they hand the job from Mike Tebow to Eric and I'm just curious, like mm -hmm. as someone who's plugged in around the league, what folks think of that a year in and kind of the state of the Mystics franchise. I think there were generally high returns on how Eric performed in year one. You know, there was obviously a lot to deal with with Washington in terms of all of their injuries and just personnel shakeups. And even though they did finish in the seventh seed and exited in the first round of the playoffs, I think there was pretty much respect for how he handled that job in year one as a rookie head coach. So I think, you know, not that I expect to shake up there, but I think you're in good hands heading forward with Eric as the head coach. Um, but just as far as like Washington's future, I mean, I think you can pretty confidently project them to be a lottery team this year. Just looking at Indiana, obviously taking a step up uh, Phoenix and Seattle, who were both lottery teams last year made big splashes in free agency. You obviously already mentioned Natasha cloud who left, from Washington to go to Phoenix. So 
I think it's going to be a lot harder to get into the playoffs. And just based on, you know, the letter that Mike Tebow wrote to the fans about, you know, just asking for a little patience, this is going to be a bit of a process. I would expect this year to be a rebuilding year, trying to see what you have on those training camp contracts, like Emily Engsler and, you know, uh, Dee Dee Richards, see what you have with Queen Agbo still. Like there's a lot of intriguing young talent that may be a factor in the next great Mystics team, but I think this year is more about discovery than anything. Yeah. Uh, Paige Becker's watched some games courtside last last off season for her. I just think next year, if she wants to switch sides and be on the bench courtside seats, that mm-hmm. would be cool. <laughs> Uh, that the Mystic certainly could be in position. Would be a great fit. Yeah, yeah, yeah it would be with that. Her and Shakira, that would be fun. Sign me up. Uh, obviously, we got to wait a full mm-hmm. year uh, to see where the Mystics fin, or I guess only a couple months to see where the Mystics finishes the W season uh, runs through the summer, and then obviously we'll see what Paige does uh, after the season next year. Sabrina Merchant, if you want uh, to read some stuff last minute, prepare yourself for the WNBA draft tonight. Highly recommend her mock draft and her coverage on Caitlin Clark's transition, and and as I said, the mock draft uh sabrina thanks so much for your time uh, great work as always and, and hopefully we'll talk to you throughout the season what's up kiddos it's your boy clinton yates from espn it's the hoffman show on the team nine eight tell your mama i said what's up